Welcome to our crypto economics crash course. This is part two, tokenomics isn't crypto economics. I'm Luciano, founder and CEO of Imperitas. I also teach economics in multiple higher ed universities. This is part two of a three part course. If you don't feel like you have a good understanding of crypto, you should go back and watch part one. If you already understand basically what goes into every token, like governance and economic models, then you might be able to just skip ahead right to part three, where we will talk about the next frontier in crypto economics. This part is focused on why is tokenomics not the same thing as crypto economics? Part one explained everything related to a crypto, but it really didn't get into the details of how they function on the back end. And that's where we're going to start in this part. There are really three overriding components, the governance in the market, the economic model, and then the humans and the machines that are involved. Now within those, there's a lot of detail that we'll get into. There's a good source here down on the bottom left. You can go there, click that link. It'll take you onto LinkedIn where this is explained why each of these pieces is important. But what follows from right here is an explanation of each of the pieces and its relationship to tokenomics and ultimately why most of this does not get covered by tokenomics and there's something new needed and that is crypto economics. So let's start with governance. These are the rules that guide the token and any company that might exist behind it. So this could be literally down to the code. This could also be explanations of voting systems in the white paper. Key pieces to look for in this kind of an explanation about governance are what about the treasury? Okay, if we put all of our wealth into this, what happens with it? And then allocations. If we're getting tokens, how are those distributed? How do they improve value? What's my benefit of holding them? You should also be looking for details about consensus. Does it just take a majority vote? You might feel uncomfortable with some things that are majority consensus. That means just 50.00001 gets their way. Maybe there are things that need 60% supermajority. Or maybe there are things that require unanimous consent. Consensus is an important component that you should look for in the governance. Usually in the white paper. Now, if the token is going to be a utility, it's got some work function, it's got some other usage, then there's also probably a business model behind it. Who's involved? What's the structure? How's that going to function? How are we going to deal with compliance issues? But governance is internal. The other thing that you will face as you take your token out into the wild is that you are part of a market. And you have to find your fit. A crypto, just because it's digital, just because it's revolutionary, it is still a commodity in human markets, which means there's a product market fit that you have to find. How do you narrow down to what that is? This proved the key, by the way, of the Silicon Valley startup success. So if you go back and look at most of the successful Silicon Valley startups, they didn't just have money. They had really good plans. and They were constantly testing them with the people who were going to actually use it not just themselves, not just their own ideas. And you can do this through qualitative research. In fact, I think that's where the best place to start is with agile qualitative research. Now, some problems, pricing, maybe some kinds of segmentation, you might need quantitative data, meaning thousands and thousands instead of tens. And the approach might be something more like a formal survey instead of a conversation. The point is you are collecting feedback in real time to ensure that whatever it is you're offering is adapting to what the market needs. It's not just a static idea that's just going to be what it is forever. Another key component of any token is its economic model. Specifically, how do you incentivize people to hold it, to trade it, to put value into it? This is pretty much the extent of what white papers do when it comes to economics. They call it tokenomics. And I'll explain in detail what that term actually means in a little bit. But within a white paper, you might find a tokenomics section and they're going to talk about maybe incentives. And this might be where the airdrop that I mentioned in part one, where the airdrop comes in. More often than not, these are vague. They usually resemble accounting summaries like we will release at a specific percentage or we will release in specific allotments or at certain milestones. 
More often than not, they're vague, and they usually look more like an accounting summary. You should be trying to find an explanation of the incentive behavior for the token. Why are people going to want to buy into this? What's the real human want, need, or, or desire that is fulfilled by this token? If that's not really clear, then you're guessing. And if all you do is look at macro things like supply and demand outcomes while you're guessing, that's a recipe for disaster. The second part of the economic model that is very important to look for are the ideas of network effects. How does the system improve as more people use it? And why would people want to spread the word to use it? It has to be word of mouth. It doesn't matter what marketing you look at. It doesn't matter what vertical, what industry, what nation. What you're going to find out is word of mouth still matters more to individual people than anything else. And the things people are really passionate about, they are talking to other people about. There is no substitute for that word of mouth network effect. How do you as a token capture that? How do you inspire that? You have to inspire it. Because these network effects are what lead to that J-curve growth. It will not last forever. I mentioned this in part one. It's not going to last forever. Diminishing returns will set in as you move through your product life cycle. Now, most cryptos have many, many, many different kinds of humans involved. And your focus with a lot of what you do, both in how you theorize and the data you collect and the feedback you listen to, should be focused on the people who are using the crypto token. Why are they doing it? You need to understand that. And within that group, predictably, it's called the Pareto Principle, there will be one in five holders who bring 80% of total value. This is true of Bitcoin right now. There are about a thousand wallets that control about 20% of the total Bitcoins. These Pareto outcomes are predictable everywhere. How are you going to understand that individual holder and how they differ from the four out of five, the other 80% who are only bringing 20% of the total value. But cryptos depend on other kinds of humans as well. Sometimes it's validators with machines or those who are elected. Sometimes it's ambassadors of the brand, of the token itself. Sometimes it's the founders or advisors. There are a lot of people who are involved with these cryptos. And they're spread across many national borders. They're not just within any one country. Similarly, cryptos are becoming more and more dependent on technology, not just for code that may be fun the functional code of how they run, but how you interact with it, the app and the platform, the UI, the UX. Financial and digital marketing tools that the crypto itself is using to spread the word and understand how people are engaging with it. There's competitive and market intelligence available. There's customer experience feedback possible. The point is that this next generation of cryptos will be even more technologically savvy. And the data that is coming from this as a result is amazing. And so this is why tokenomics emerged in an attempt to explain these complex systems that have governance and have a market and have humans and have a technology stack. How should they work? It's also known as token economics, but it pretty much is exclusively monetary and financial market theory. And that's a problem because those are only subsections of economic theory overall. Now, the monetary mindset in particular, I mentioned before in part one, generation zero and generation one, they're almost all trying to be competitors to fiat money. And I think this is what influenced the early ideas of tokenomics because it is almost exclusively about the equation of exchange, the quantity theory of money. And within a crypto white paper, you might see this, you might see a net present value, but it's not really a lot of economics. It's using one piece from one school of thought about one part of the economy. The other, beyond the monetary idea, is the financial focus. And this is because so many cryptos have been considered securities. People hold them and don't want to give them up. And that creates an investment incentive, usually based on net present value. If the net present value cash flows in minus cash flows out, discounted by some rate but because of future uncertainty into the present terms, if that's better than fiat, then you will rationally hold it. 
This is where almost all of the regulatory action is happening for the moment. That's going to change. Regulators just spread out into the rest of the market. Because tokenomics was the first attempt to explain these complex systems, we shouldn't expect that it would have the most complete picture, and it doesn't. Because what it really leaves out by focusing on a monetary or a financial approach, even if it is a token that functions as currency, you still miss out the why. Why are people holding it? Why are there some people who will never sell their Bitcoin ever? You will have to pry it out of their cold, dead hands. They're not giving it up. Why? Their motivation is totally different from somebody who just wants to have a quick you know, return on investment and has heard a lot about Bitcoin and jumps in on Coinbase and freaks out after the first dip and then sells and gets out. They're totally different individuals. And tokenomics, by looking at those macro outcomes, does not get at what is going on underneath. And so this is why crypto economics has been proposed. So this is a quote from Joe, crypto economics is a way of doing incentivized mechanism design to enable many actors to contribute their resources to validating transactions and securing that network. That is not just output quantity and output price. How do you design the system ahead of time to get people to contribute as holders, as validators, as people spreading word of mouth, creating network effects, how do you incentivize that from the beginning? It's not good enough to just have an idea. How do you make sure that idea has the best chance of success possible? And that's at the core of crypto economics, which is coming up next. So looking back, if you felt lost today, you didn't understand the components of a token that go into tokenomics, maybe go back and watch part one again in Intro to Crypto. If you feel like you understand this idea of a monetary and financial focus on the economics of these tokens that have a governance component, a market component, humans and machines, then you're ready to move on to part three coming up next, the next frontier for crypto economics. I love to talk crypto. You can get a hold of me at any of these four places. If you want a PDF of the slides from today, send me an email. Otherwise, you can get a hold of me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or our Telegram channel. Thank you very much. I will see some of you at part three, the next frontier for crypto economics.